you know, it is cold and it is snowing, and I think I am going to wait until I get home to record this Draft House diary entry. Though it would be kind of appropriate, because this is a Draft House diary for Sunday, March 24th, when I went out here to the Alamo Draft House at Littleton's Aspen Grove to see Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. All right, this is better. It's definitely warmer. So let's get on with it. Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. My brief review? The best Ghostbusters movie since the original in 1984. Now that's a lot, I know. So let me walk you through how I feel about the other movies in this franchise. Ghostbusters, the original 1984 movie, one of the best American movies ever made. Not the greatest, not the most important, but one of the best just in terms of movie making and constructing a movie. Ghostbusters knew how to tell a story. It had a straightforward story. It had engaging characters. It had this wonderful gloss of academic insight over the entire thing, forbidden knowledge, all the kind of stuff that would absolutely lure me in. Ghostbusters was the first movie that I went back to time after time after time to see it when it was in movie theaters to just analyze how it was put together in terms of its storytelling and how it was structured and how it used the differences among the characters to drive key points in the story. It was a fascinating thing to study. It still is. But on top of that, it is simply a fun movie. Not many movies that are just more fun to watch. Then, Ghostbusters 2 in 1989. That was one of the biggest disappointments I've ever encountered in a movie theater. There were so many of the same people involved, and yet it seemed as if they had completely lost track, or never really understood in the first place, what had made Ghostbusters work so well. And they undermined so much of what was done. Some of the characters that they created and turned into real important parts of the story, including supporting characters like Janine Melnitz, they just turned them into cartoons that had no connection and no relation to what had been established about the characters in the past. But more important, as far as the overall story, it was one of those 80s sequels that didn't know how to be a sequel. They had told a story in Ghostbusters about underdogs trying something crazy but that they believed in, and in the end, they triumphed. And there was this note of triumph at the end of Ghostbusters 1984. And in 1989, it was as if they decided, well, we've got to tell the same story again, so we have to somehow make them underdogs again. Whereas good writing, clever storytelling, could have taken them from that note of triumph and said, all right, what's next? What is going to challenge our heroes now that they have proven themselves? Very few 80s sequels were able to do that. There were so many movies that just erased what came before in order to tell the same story again in a sequel. That's what Ghostbusters 2 did. It tried to tell the same story, a few new set pieces, but it told the same story badly. Then, Ghostbusters 2016, this reboot. I wanted to like that movie so much. There were so many talented people involved in making that. And yet, it, it didn't come together. There were some good scenes, there was some good humor, but the whole movie, there seemed to be a kind of a flat sameness in the writing and the characterizations. There were times when they were on top of their game, but the other 90% of the movie, they seemed to be going through motions. Very disappointed in Ghostbusters 2016. Then comes Ghostbusters Afterlife in 2021. I didn't see that until very recently, and you know, I was very pleasantly surprised. I really enjoyed that movie. Was it as good as 84? No, but it was a good movie. It, it seemed to understand what made the original movie fun, as well as a, an exceptionally crafted story. And it introduced new characters that fit with the tone of the Ghostbusters universe. It gave us glimpses of other characters, and it brought us back to some of that nostalgia. It didn't dwell on that nostalgia too much, but it had enough to make us really feel as if this is a continuation of that world that we knew and loved from all those years ago. And now, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. I think this takes what was good about Ghostbusters Afterlife 
and it adds to it more of the feel of the original Ghostbusters, and it mostly does that because of its New York location. Ghostbusters was such a New York movie, it impressed me how much Ghostbusters Afterlife worked being set in Oklahoma. Ghostbusters Frozen Empire brings us back to New York. Some of it is fan service. We want to see the firehouse again. We want to see Slime. Well, I didn't want to see Slimer again, but a lot of people want to see the Green Ghost again. Once again, it didn't dwell on that nostalgia too much. It used it to maintain its presence in the Ghostbusters world. And to the extent they brought back in the classic characters, they were fun. They weren't overused. One of the highlights of the movie, though, was Ernie Hudson as Winston Zeddemore. They established him as a very interesting character in Ghostbusters Afterlife. What had happened to him, how his life had gone since the original Ghostbusters, or I guess since Ghostbusters 2. And they allowed Ernie Hudson to play a really interesting character and to develop that character and have that character really drive critical parts of the plot. So he was one of the most fun parts of the movie. Other parts of my trip to the Alamo. The pre-show was a lot of fun, as expected. It was all Ghostbusters themed. It included a few segments of Ghostbusting Around the World, which was showcasing commercials and fan films and knockoff films and other things from all over the world, including a, uh, an American fan film. And it was fun to get that insight into the phenomenon that Ghostbusters had been during its heyday in the 80s. There were also some other ghost-related things, some ghost-related commercials, an interesting and spooky dance macabre animation segment, a music video of the Ghostbusters theme as performed by the Device Orchestra, and there was a long segment towards the end of Ghostbusters Previous Life, which was just a big collection of cartoons and serial commercials and fast food tie-ins and a whole bunch of clips from performances by Ray Parker Jr. performing the Ghostbusters song on television shows from around the world, often with kitschy ghost-themed set decoration. That was kind of fun to see. He seemed to be having fun doing it, and I hope he was. Not everybody gets a chance to have that kind of a worldwide hit tied into a blockbuster movie. I hope he uh, kept going with that for as long as it stayed fun and that he made a zillion dollars with it. For dinner, I had the grilled chicken club. I've had that before and it's always very good. It's a little heavier than you would think a grilled chicken sandwich would be because it's got avocado and bacon and cheese and a lot of other things, but it's not overloaded, so it turns out very good. As for the theater, the staff was very friendly. Seating at Littleton is usually very comfortable. One issue, though, was once again, we were late being allowed into the theater, so we missed maybe the first five minutes or so of that pre-show. Littleton Aspen Grove had gotten better at that, but in recent weeks there have been a few screenings where, for whatever reason, maybe they're not staggering the screenings and the cleaning schedule quite right, there have been delays in getting us into the theater. But I did have a great time, I really enjoyed the movie, and this was a fun visit to the Alamo. I hope you enjoyed this Draft House Diary. If you did, please click that like button, and if you want to know about more Draft House Diaries, click the subscribe button. I'll be back with more soon. In the meantime, enjoy your movies, and when you do, stay till the end of the credits.